So years ago, I heard Dan Sullivan. He was, I don't, I can't remember the context that he was talking about it in, but it, it had some, but it was tool belt, toolbox, tool shed was the conversation. And, and I've done some podcasts with Dan where we've actually talked about this, where I started thinking that, well, what if you utilize that for um, marketing? So I want to ask you this, Dean. So I I just wrote this down right now. So Mm -hmm. it says, um, Basically, you know, I should probably move the comments here so I can see myself around the screen here. So tool belt are things that you use uh, daily. Uh, Toolbox are things you use frequently and tool shed special needs. So if you can think of a tool belt, toolbox, tool shed. Mm -hmm. And for all and and so if you think of like your phone, you know, this is a tool that you may, you know, use daily. You want you don't want to crack screen something that's slow doesn't work. If you're going to have tools that you use daily, you want to have the very best, most effective ones. Like when Elko gives a presentation in a few minutes, I would almost like to think, okay, if you like the strategy, is this something you want to have on your tool belt, your toolbox, your tool shed? Because what happens with so much marketing is it may work, but it's, it's not exploited. And if you hear an idea or a model and you're able to use it over and over again, like Dave Kekich, one of his Kekich credos is, you know, a few basic moves produce all results. Like a a few basic moves produce all results. You know, with with anyone in martial arts, you know, they don't learn 4,000 moves. They learn a handful that they do 4,000 times in order to have mastery. So in terms of your uh, tool belt, toolbox, tool shed, one of the ways I would explain it to my carpet cleaners, because that's how long ago I started doing it when there was no internet. I'd be like, well, you want to have a free recorded message on your tool belt. You want to use it every single day. You're going to have it on business cards. You're going to have it, you know, on the side of your van. Uh, You're going to use a consumer awareness guide almost daily. You're going to have a lead generation ad almost daily. Then a use frequently uh, like a tool. uh, So your tool belt would have like the free recorded message tool. Uh, toolbox would be like a monthly client newsletter. You're going to mail that out every single month. Um, in, in a joint venture, you're going to use, uh, you know, frequently. And then like a client appreciation dinner or like a, a, a holiday or Christmas campaign is an example. Like one of the things that I put into my calendar for starting in September, that early on, is use Santa in marketing. Because I used to do a lot of stuff with Dan Kennedy with Santa campaigns. Even if you're, you know, even if you think Santa, if you don't even celebrate Christmas, the bottom line is, is that using Santa in marketing is actually, but you're not going to use it every month. You're going to use it right, you know, November and December. Um, But I'm putting it in early enough because when it comes up to December this year, I'm going to develop, you know, special need marketing campaigns built around Santa. I will probably send, uh, you know, like like physical, um, you know, uh, ribbons as an example and packages. They're super light. They're lumpy mail. And I will start incorporating that in some things that I mail to people and you'll, you'll see. Uh, but in, for, Dean, I want to ask you, what are fundamentals, essential things that would make the biggest difference for everyone here? if they were think to using them on a regular basis, like nine word emails you're using yeah, yeah, like that's daily. Something. Exactly. Right? So give, give, give a couple of things that if everyone had these working, and again, I'm, I want to give this framework because I want you to start taking the, the different ideas that you hear mm-hmm. from people speaking and say, I'm going to put that on my tool belt. I'm going to put this in my toolbox. I'm going to put this in my tool shed. So you don't, you, you have it, you have it available to you when you need yeah. it. So, yeah, like I wanted you to. You know, that's what I look for is what can you use as annuities? What are the things that you can set up a cadence to do? Um, for example, uh, we were working with a home services uh, company in in London, in UK, and we did a, a nine word email campaign. I mean, they, they had thousands of of clients, so we set up a. Uh, team of baristas, email baristas, to individually email out to people in the fall and say, uh, hey, Joe, have you had your boiler serviced yet this fall? 
that was it. Just a nine word email boiler in the subject line. That's what they call their furnace or whatever. Um, so sent that out and they would book boiler servicing as fast as they could send out the emails. So that is an annuity. Now I just right. did, um, an event with uh, Mike Aguilero. We did a, a breakthrough blueprint um, with his group that are all home services. And on day one, we talked about this idea of annuities. And this was, uh, you know, in um, April, end of April. And so I suggested send out an email and say, um, hey, Joe, have you had your air conditioner serviced yet this spring? And they were sending out that email and everybody's reporting back with the tally of all of the business that they were booking um, by people responding to those emails. So there's something that you can do twice a year that you've got an annuity to bookend the spring and the fall if you're a home service business. We do, for 90-minute books, we send out at the be and this is, What's crazy is that the first of every month, we send out a nine word email to the list and say, hey, Joe, would you like to get started on your book this month? Just book in the subject line. Yeah. Hi, Joe, would you like to get started on your book this month? And every single time we send that out, five, six, seven people reply and say, yes, this is the month. They know that that's their, they know what we do. They know that they want to do it. They haven't gotten around to it. And just gently asking them, would you like to get started this month? They re reply. So Christmas is one of my favorite things like that because you've got, you know, it comes around once a year. We did a campaign where if you're selling e-commerce stuff or you're selling from a physical um, location, is putting together a little Christmas wish PDF that shows your most popular things of what might be great uh, things. Like if you remember getting the Sears Christmas wish book, when it would come in the mail, you would go through and you'd like, you know, highlight the things that you, you'd circle the things that you wanted. And then you'd kind of leave it around. So your parents would see what you, uh, what you wanted. And so we started to kind of design a campaign around that to send out an email to, um, you know, do a little email for people that says, hi, Joe, I figured out a way for you to get exactly what you want at Christmas, click here. And then we take them and it a, shows a video of showing people the, the Christmas wish catalog PDF that you can download and say, here's what you do is you print this out and then take a highlighter and highlight the things that you want and then leave it around the house so that people will see what it is that you want for, um, for Christmas. And we've had, it's kind of fun. We did that with a ski shop with a, um, uh, Lane Bowers with his barefoot water skiing stuff with, uh, um, fishing, uh, guy with, um, all kinds of anything that would be physical goods that you could um, that you could uh, do. It's pretty amazing, you know, when you start to develop this little um, calendar of annuities that you can pull out at just the the right time. I mean, it's funny you talk about Dan uh, Kennedy, you know, because he had something. He said something in. I think 2001 that really like made me laugh. Cause you know, he always thinks about his followers as a herd, you know, like bunch of cattle that he's branded on the ranch kind of thing. And his concept was to whatever he wants anything or needs anything, he sends the bill to the herd. Yeah, and yeah. that was like, you make an offer and send the bill to the herd. And that just like struck me as pretty funny, you know, and so I, it's funny. And it also, how much, how much Dan Kennedy doesn't really give a shit about humans. Exactly. All it's just, cattle. it's but, totally depersonified, you know, depersonalizing the relationship. This, this <laughs> cattle, right. But he's a that smart was, dude. He's a smart dude. Absolutely. And so I wanted to go on this trip to Scotland, this amazing uh, golf trip. And I thought, you know what, that's something I'm going to send the bill to the herd 
for this. And I made a offer. I put together a little uh, teleclass uh, series. This was back in 2001 um, or something and uh, sent it out to my list and sold, you know, like $47,000 of this, uh, this course and, uh, you know, got the trip to Scotland. We ended up going, you know, three of the next four years. We went to uh, Scotland every year. It was the, the third annual once in a lifetime trip to uh, Scotland, but we played all the, all the uh, British Open courses and, uh, you know, had such a great, uh, a great experience, but that was, and that was an entree into like sending the bill to the herd. It's kind of a. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. It's so good to see you all. Um, I am excited and I do have a presentation that I'm excited to share and offer my insights. And then of course, have a conversation afterwards where we can all share our insight. All right. So yes, we are going to talk video marketing today. And I'm, I'm super excited about this because of course this is, this is what I do. So I, I get a little bit obsessed over this, but in a very good way, <laughs> um, we're going to talk about, as Timothy said, where and when to use video in your marketing that will actually make a difference. So before I start, you just heard a lot about me in terms of the draw shop and business. I also wanted to share really quickly, today's my four year anniversary with this blended family. You heard that I was divorced back in 2006. I met this amazing man about 13 years ago and we finally tied the knot four years ago. So here we are. You think entrepreneurship is challenging. Having a blended family kind of kicks your butt. <laughs> it's awesome. So any of you step parents out there. So enough about me though. We are going to talk about video marketing, and I have a question for you to think about. I'll see on the side if I can see you raising your hand. Hey, I hope you're enjoying this video, and I want to let you know that I have a new book that's come out, and if you'd like to get it absolutely free, there's a link below in the description, or you can wait till the end of this video, or you can simply go to joesfreebook.com and you can get a copy there. But for how many of you would this make a really big difference in your business? getting more qualified leads, increasing engagement, and getting higher conversions and more sales. Would that be like a big difference in your business? Would that be considered I'm making a difference? Okay, cool, because that's what we're gonna talk about today. I'm gonna share with you insights, and I'm also gonna share with you the nine types of top performing videos that you can use in your marketing funnels that will bring in more traffic, bring in more qualified leads, and keep them engaged and ultimately convert them into sales because that's what we want. So what I've done is I've broken these nine types of videos into the three parts of your funnel. So we have the top of the funnel, the middle of the funnel, and the bottom of the funnel. And in each of those, I'm gonna talk about the three important videos to have in those parts of the funnel. Some of them might not be trendy, but they are reliable. Some of them might not be super sexy, but they are effective. And some of them might not be new to you, but they are proven. So what I'm hoping is that you might say, yeah, I've heard of that, but am I using that? Maybe some of these things are going to be a reminder to you. My goal is that you're really thinking about, hmm, where am I not using video that could really make a difference? So let's talk about the top of the funnel. This is really the place where people have no idea who you are yet. So you want to attract them, you want to qualify, and you want to capture them, capture their information. The whole purpose of this beginning part where they have no idea who you are is to earn your lead's attention. Remember, they're completely cold at this place and they know nothing about you. So what you want to do is qualify whether or not they would be a good fit for your business. This is the place to do that. And then you want to capture them into your audience, whether that means they are a follower on your social media or on a YouTube channel, maybe a subscriber to your email list, and just turning them into a prospect and bringing them into the buyer's journey. So one of the most very important videos in this part of the funnel are problem solution videos. So remembering that they have no idea who you are. They are just going about their business, tragically unaware that you even exist. At the same time, they are painfully aware of the problem that they have. 
So think of your service or product and what problem does your prospect have that is, it's painful. They want to get rid of it. So you want to, with these videos, meet them where they are. What are they struggling with? What is the conversation that's happening in their head? What are the thoughts that they're having? This is where you can meet them and immediately get them to go, oh my gosh, they understand what I'm going through. And you also want to offer the solution. Here's the solution to that pain point. And then because you've intrigued them that you have a solution to this problem, now you're inviting them to, to stick around where you can start to bring them more value. I kind of think of this, and I'm sure you guys have heard this before, this part of the funnel is like that first date. The second part or the second video in this funnel is your why video. So in your why video, this is an awesome opportunity to really talk about why you're doing what you're doing. What is the what are you, what are the values that you have within your brand or your product, your service, your company? What is the mission that you're on? What is the vision that you have in terms of where you're going and how many people you're going to help? This is also a great place for people to start to see why they're going to choose you over the competition. And another thing about this why video is it's an opportunity to share your stories. We all have reasons hopefully, that we have started our businesses. Something was really important to us. We saw a lack in the industry that we wanted to fix. Or you have some type of a story, maybe it's your own hero's journey, that got you to where you are now to start this business. People get inspired by that and they become connected. And what really happens is that they start to see themselves in that story. The third video, the simple action video. It is literally as simple as it sounds. Show them how to take the next step with you as simply as possible into solving their problem. So what that looks like is, hey, click here, opt in, give us your name and email, book an appointment, let's do a free strategy call, download this free guide. It's giving them just a bit of something to keep them going. It's kind of like, I don't want to forget you. I went on that first date with you. We had a good time. We had some good banter. I'm, I'm kind of into this. I'm not committed yet. I'm not sure, but I think I'm interested enough to go on that second date and learn more about you. So yeah, maybe, maybe I will give you my number just to make sure I don't lose contact with you. Think of it that way. So now that we've got these leads that are turning from cold into warm, we're now bringing them into the middle of the funnel. So you've just qualified. At the beginning of the top of the funnel, it was qualifying. So you've qualified them into, okay, you're interested enough. I want you now in this, in this middle of the funnel. Let's continue this journey together. This is where you really start to build trust, educating them, and really, again, differentiating yourself from the competition. So you here are educating your leads about your offer and how that offer can help them achieve their goals and solve their problems. Essentially, you want to do both of those. It's where you continue to set yourself apart because at this stage, they are comparison shopping. They have a problem. They're probably opting in everywhere. They're trying to see who's going to be the best provider to solve this problem. What's going to be the best diet? What's going to be the best fitness plan? What's going to be the best lead generator? What's going to be the best solution uh, for my marriage? Whatever that problem is, they're opting in and they want to find out who's going to be the best person. Again, dating. I'm dating a lot of people and I might, I'm going to go on this second date. Who's, who's going to be the one that I want to actually spend my time with? So the primary focus here is, again, educating them and really building that trust. And it's also important to continue to deliver ongoing, really good, massive content. When I say massive content, I don't, or massive value, I don't mean a ton of stuff that overwhelms them. It can be just little things, but it's just enough that gets them to go, okay, I'm getting a lot. I'm actually getting a lot out of this. And they're not really asking me for anything. There's no strings attached. It's just keeping it light and mellow. So one of the greatest videos that you can have at this point is a comparison video. So these, these are videos that can really answer the objections that they're having at this point right now. What are the questions going on about, well, if I were, if I were to take this, you know, take this further, are there, are there any red flags? Are there things coming up? Answer them before they even have a chance to ask you about them. It's also a place to point out the 
industry inadequate standards. So you can start to talk about, and I don't mean, you know, shame your competitors, but what are the things that you know people are frustrated about in your industry that you do differently? This is, this, these are key things that people get attached to. Well, most of these people have no guarantee. It's, it, there's, there's so much risk involved. But if I go with this brand, there's not really any risk. So that, that makes me feel more comfortable. What are the things that, that you do better? And what are the differentiators between the competition and yourself? And this is also a great place if you have a compelling guarantee, this is a great place to, to talk about that in these comparison videos. Hey, I hope you're enjoying this video and I wanna let you know that I have a new book that's come out and if you'd like to get it absolutely free, there's a link below in the description or you can wait till the end of this video or you can simply go to joesfreebook.com and you can get a copy there. The next explainer videos. Now I am totally biased here because we are a company that does explainer videos, but I do believe that any video marketing strategy needs to live leverage explainer videos at all parts in, in your marketing. And this is one of the best places in this middle of, of the funnel, because if you have a product or service that is complex, that is a little bit confusing or can be overwhelming, this is the place where you can explain it in the most simplest way. Little, little sound bites, maybe it's daily videos. There's a lot of people that are doing really great things on, on YouTube or in their email campaigns where it's a daily video that might be a one minute tidbit of value that can actually move you, move people forward. So the audience is going, wow, that was just a little bit of advice, but it actually was a game changer for my day or for my week. Things like that, little explainer videos that just kind of explain something so, so simply. And you're just kind of like dripping out this, this content to them and getting them more connected to your brand. So with explainer videos, you really want to show how easy it is, whether that's your service, your product, whatever those things are. This is really how easy it is when, when you sign up with our brand. This is really how easy the fitness program is. This is really how, how easy it is to use our software program. You also want to show the desired results and get them to see themselves in that after, that after transformation moment. These are the results that using this will bring you. And then risk reversal is always amazing because people are so much more likely to stay connected to your brand when they don't feel that there is this big, heavy, committed risk involved. And now demo videos. So we have discussed the general problem solution. We, we discussed explainer videos, comparison videos, demo videos. I'm, I'm a huge fan of demo videos and tutorial videos because it makes you, it, it gets you into the customer mode as if you're already a customer. It lets you experience what your solution is before they've even committed to the solution. So for example, if, if, it is, if it's an app or if it's um, uh, some type of a software, or maybe it's, hey, here's what you're gonna get when you, when you sign on with this fitness program or diet program, you get to go through what they're actually going to experience. So here, here's what you'll do. And it, it actually helps people to realize it's not going to be overwhelming. It's actually gonna be super simple. And wow, this really is gonna be a solution to my problem. It demonstrates, the real value in solving the real problems your prospects are, are struggling with. Demo videos are awesome. They're really great after, um, at this point, after a, a sales call, after somebody has booked an appointment with you, wanted to talk about something, great, let me send you over a demo video that you can share with your team, that you can really experience what it is that happens once you become a customer. And it allows you the opportunity to really show off your product or service before they buy in a way that is compelling and easy to understand. And the goal is to really make them get excited and go, okay, well, now I want to, I want to keep having this. I want to keep having that experience. So now your leads are a lot more warmed up. They know more about you. They're trusting you. And now comes the critical point of, are they going to move forward with you? Are they going to become a customer? This is where it is so important to prove, reassure, and convert. 
So the purpose of this stage of the funnel is showing overwhelming concrete proof that your product or service can del deliver the results that they need. This is where you're going to address again the objections, which might be a little bit different, but the objections that happen that come up right before you click that buy button or say, yes, I'm gonna sign the contract. What are those objections? It, this is like so powerful at this stage to answer these. And then of course, it's making that irresistible offer that makes them say, okay, this is a no brainer. How do I not do this? I've experienced the demo. You've answered my objections. I've, I've got all of this proof and reason why I can't think of a reason not to. That's the goal here at the bottom of the funnel. So case studies, this is where case studies come in. Case studies are incredible because they, they actually, they help with two things. They provide the social proof that your product or your service works. They go, oh my gosh, okay, that person who had a very similar situation to me, a problem just like I did, got those results. They've been through all the stuff I've been through. Then this happened, and now they have these results. Amazing. Everybody loves a really good case study. I know for me, it's definitely the thing that pushes me forward and goes, okay, if, if that company similar to mine got those results, I'm in. It also communicates the scope of results and transformation that you can deliver. And that's what people care about. At the end of the day, they care about that after. Where is this gonna bring me and how is it gonna make me feel afterwards? How does this make my life better? If it made their life better, okay, this, this might be the thing for me. So now we go into video testimonials, which video testimonials are a little bit different than case studies because video testimonials are, are really going to be about the emotional aspect of, of the experience that your customers have had with you. So where case studies have a rational and analytical component, video testimonials are, are mostly emotional, emotionally and story driven. What do those need to contain? And these are coming from your customers. So it's not just a case study that 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 you, you've got printed out with numbers. This is coming from your customers. And what you want to accomplish in these videos are how they used to struggle before discovering your offer, the dramatic moment that your solution came to the rescue, and the amazing after picture of their life right now. People get so connected to these. And there's some great testimonials out there, but a lot of times people say, yeah, that was a great company to work with, great team, it was awesome. But people just go, okay, cool, somebody liked working with you. It's really about the story behind it that people get drawn to. So really painting the picture of here, here's where I was at. I tried every single fitness program. I tried every single diet on the planet. And then I saw this product and I, I you know what? I just, it came at a time when I was so desperate. And so I used it. And here I am three months later, I have more energy. My relationships are better. I'm doing better at work. I just feel like I'm on top of the world. Those are the things you want your video testimonials to contain. And finally, the ninth top performing video. This is the sales video. So really sales videos are, they're like an explainer video, but they have a much bigger job. They take on a lot of responsibility. So whether it's a, a short sales video, a long video sales letter, the messaging is gonna be so important because you're gonna kind of take a bunch of those things that we talked about in those first eight videos, and you're gonna put them, you're gonna sprinkle them throughout this sales video and really take them through the whole journey again. This is where you're gonna explain your offer in a very clear and compelling way. You're gonna agitate the prospect's problem, not in a mean way, but just really, you know, we know what it's like. Show, show that empathy of you know what it's like to have that problem. You're going to counter the objections and concerns quickly and decisively. You're going to provide as much proof as possible for each claim of value. And then you're going to secure the sale with a powerful and specific call to action. So those are the nine videos. And I want to answer before we open up into questions and it sharing insights, I want to answer two questions right off the bat, because these are some of the most popular questions that, that we get at, at our business at the draw shop. 
And that is what medium of videos should I use? I just talked about all these different videos. And now you're like, okay, wait, do I have to be on my phone and do this? Do I have to have a full production crew? Do I have to um, have animated? Does it have to be whiteboard? Should it be 2D? It it can be overwhelming all the types of videos. And here's the truth, the truth of the matter. It can be any of, of those styles. If you have a full production crew, that's awesome. If you have your handheld device with the awesome uh, quality of, of filming that they do now, you can do that as well. If you really need to explain something that's complex, do a whiteboard animation video. If you want to share numbers and, and show a specific case study in a video, try some try some infographics. There's so many different ways that you can, so many different mediums that you can use that are really, really effective. What you want to make sure of is the messaging. You want to make sure that you're accomplishing all of those goals that I talked about within those videos. So the the quality in terms of the production, yes, of course it's important, but equally as important as, as the messaging and what people are seeing and hearing and how it's going to inspire them at the end of that video to take the next step. It's so important and be clear on each video. What next step do I need this person to take? Is it opting in? Is it replying to this email? Is it booking an appointment? Is it clicking by now? Is it call me on the phone? Is it just to reply yes or no? Just what is that clear action that you need to take and know that at the beginning? So yeah, your videos can be live action. You can see all different samples here, live action, talking head, animation, just you with your smartphone. The next question that we get a ton of is, how do I know I'm going to see ROI from these videos? That's a big question, right? Because you're probably, if you're going to a production company and you're going to spend a lot of money, you want to know that you're going to see some ROI. That's with anything that you invest in. And I'm glad you asked this because we get this question so much. We actually created an ROI calculator. And this is where you can plug in, for example, a landing page. You can plug in some numbers. How many, how many visitors do I typically get to this page? What's the lifetime value of my customer? How much am I going to invest in a video? You can plug in all of those numbers and it will spit out what your projected ROI from that one video will be. How do you stand out in an extremely crowded space? So that's Mm. the question. And so we, we picked questions. And when I say we, I mean, my team has gone through like a thousand of these questions and we're, we're categorizing them as we do these, we'll continue to answer them. And uh, so, uh, but they picked ones that they felt would be helpful to most people here also. So how do you stand out in an extremely crowded space? And the notes that I wrote to this, and then I'll have you go, Dean, is mm-hmm. for one, where do you want to stand out, right? It's one thing, like, why do you want to stand out in a crowded space? Can you niche it down, narrow it down and, and be in a space where you're not so crowded? That's, right. That's one way to think about it. And then I want to say this up front, because this is going to apply to many of the messages, uh, questions that people will have, which is Dean Jackson's quote about uh, a compelling offer is 10 times more powerful than a convincing argument. Uh A compelling offer is 10 times more powerful than a convincing argument. So write that down. We say it on almost every I Love Marketing meetup group, uh, but it's worth uh, worth understanding. So Dean, uh, answer that question if you could, sir. So- this reminds me of this uh, thing we've been talking about where, especially in times where people are contracting, where you know, I'm assuming they're saying, how do I stand out and get people to do business with me? That's really what the essence of the question would be. Um, yeah. And the thing that is where the, all the competition is, is at the purchasing desk. That's what everybody's trying to get the attention of the purchasing desk saying, hey, give me a purchase order, give me a purchase order so that I can deliver these wonderful goods or services to you. And you're trying to get, uh, you're trying to compete for that attention. That's where it gets crowded. And one thing that just kind of dawned on me and things like this is that there is, almost zero competition at the receiving dock. And if you just go around to the building and bring things into the business, you're met with open arms. Everybody's 100% authorized in any business to bring money in to the business. So if you can, instead of spending time and money 
trying to fight for attention to convince somebody to give you business, if you spent that same amount of time and attention on just getting a result for them and leading with that, as opposed to, um, you know, trying to uh, convince them to give you business, you're going to find that it's a much easier path. It's far easier. Anytime you have the possibility to give somebody a result for free to start the ball rolling, that's going to be a win for you. And it's easy to get attention when you're, when you come bearing gifts, money, the thing that they, that they want business, you know, that's really the, um, that's really the, the thing without knowing the context of what the, um, what the actual situation is, but uh, I'm on the you call. Could, you could apply it to any, Oh, you are. Okay. There you yeah. go. Let's, let's hear what Aaron, go ahead and uh, elaborate. So I'm in the, I'm in the real estate pirate industry. We, we're, you know, we buy the motivated seller houses yeah. and uh, yeah. five years ago, four years ago, we could send out two or 3000 letters or postcards yes. and yeah. be inundated with calls, like more calls than you could take in a two, three day period would come in. Now you can uh -huh. send 5,000 postcards and you're lucky if one or two people call. Right. So I switched it up. I went to the, the Genius Network annual event and I met the guys from Tulip Marketing and I, and I had this idea like maybe I'll do a newsletter and I'll send a newsletter out to kind of my target audience and bring value to them. And we did that for a few months and it was like the calls we got were, is this a joke? Is this a scam? Who are you? Why are you sending this? And very few people called in. Mm -hmm. So it just, it, it produced, I thought delivering value and giving them, I mean, we're in California. So there's all kinds of information on, on the laws that are constantly changing and how it affects landlords. And that's really my primary market is marketing to burnt out landlords and then acquiring their properties. Mm -hmm. So I thought doing that, presenting a newsletter with a lot of content would, would generate more leads. It, it didn't, it didn't work. So mm -hmm. now it's, uh, you know, we have a lot of wall street buyers and Silicon Valley buyers in our market space. Now mm -hmm. uh, just become very inundated with uh, uh, bigger players who and they can spend $100,000 a month on ad spend. And being backed by Silicon Valley, it's almost as if they don't need to show profit. They just need to show revenue to get right. a million dollar valuation. So yeah. like, oh, we bought 800 houses last year. We made, you know, we lost $100 million, but worth, we're worth $5 billion now and we should go public. So yeah. you have the mom and pop guys like me who want to buy just 25 to 50 houses a year. Mm -hmm. And across the board, we're all struggling. Mm hmm so what's your number one um, challenge, do you think? Like when you're, if you, how are you selecting the homes that you want to buy? So it's based on, on criteria about the, the type of house. Like I, I know uh, very pinpointed on the type of property that I want to buy. So when a call comes in, it doesn't matter the situation or the seller. I know that that house fits. It's a square peg, a plug, a peg in a square, mm -hmm. you know, whole situation. So we're, mm -hmm. can I see one of the letters, Tina? Yeah. So we're trying to do stuff like, like, you know, you know, we're sending out letters and, you know, we're putting in like big dinosaur stamps and we're putting in like, you know, little heart stamps on the outside. Like mm -hmm. I'm thinking like if, 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 if this shows up and it's addressed to, this one's addressed to Caesar and his wife gets it, the open rate on this is going to be a hundred percent because it has a nice big sure. heart stamp on the outside and the handwriting, yeah, right. is, you know, women's handwriting and blue ink. So you know, whether yes. there's a response from that, I don't know, but at least it gets opened and read, and then maybe we yeah. can elicit a response from that. So, and go. what's inside? What's the offer? So you're saying, we want to buy your house, call us? Yeah, well, it, yeah, it's a little more personal. Uh, you know, we, we're, I can read you the letter, it's around here somewhere. Um, but just, I mean, just the music yeah, of it is that. It just has some information about, hey, I'm local, I'm a veteran, and, uh, you know, I'm interested in buying your property. It's a really easy process. Uh, so, yeah. yeah, it's, you know, typically you like yellow letter stuff, but yeah. I try to do a little bit better on it. Like, mm -hmm. And how, how did Caesar get on the list? Uh, so this particular campaign is a uh, driving for dollars campaign where, you know, we have somebody who drives around and just looks at, looks for properties yeah. that have signs of financial distress, like a right. totally burnt lawn or it's overgrown, broken windows, bad roofs. So yeah. we have about a couple hundred properties on that list that, that somebody's visually driven by and seen and said, man, that's the distress situation. Yeah. Doesn't care. 
Got it. So if you so then everybody on that list, you're kind of like uh, there. They fit that bill. Correct. And so you wonder what would happen with them over the next hundred weeks, let's say over the next, like if instead of thinking we're going to mail the letter, he's going to say, Oh, what a relief. Thank God. Somebody sent me this letter. Let's get out of this today. Uh, but what if over the next hundred weeks, if you looked at it, how many of those are actually going to uh, do something? You know, if you took like a longer um, approach to it, like instead of just one time, like go going and, uh, you know, I call it strip mining, like just kind of going through mailing the letter they call. That's how it used to be forever, right? You could just mail it, they'd call and you'd buy and it all happened quickly. But what if those, those distressed houses are a problem um, and even if they don't reply to your letter, there's still a problem. And what would happen over the next, you know, two years, if you take a thousand, how many of those homes do you have on your uh, list? Uh, this one, 308. Okay. So of those 308, if you take that sort of longer term approach to it, more than just like the one, one, um, you know, one kind of uh, thing that I wonder what that would look like, you know, how, how many of them actually do something? How long have you been doing this now? So in the past, I, I primarily have just mailed postcards for years. Okay. And then, yeah. you know, kind of this younger generation came into the business and yeah. they got into skip tracing and cold calling and test texting and really yeah. voicemail and really just beat us older dudes out. Right. So, right. <laughs> so now we've skip traced this whole list and we're going to, you know, do the mail, but then hit them yeah. multiple times through different aspects. So we'll, we'll hit them with the mail. We'll, uh, try to, uh, you know, find them on social media and, mm -hmm. and do some targeted marketing that way. Uh, but, you know, I open up my mailbox. I have dozens and dozens of rentals here and I open up my mailbox and there's, you know, multiple letters on a weekly basis from Sunday, from Open Door, from, you know, Zilla, from all these companies that are, you know, doing basically the same thing, but yeah. you know, now with the hard stickers and handwritten. So. Yeah. Yeah. It is so, um, yeah, it's, a, it's, it's noisy now right like and that's the thing is what what would be the thing if you were to think would be a a, a softer step than uh call us to buy it kind of thing like one of the things we do with the i work with traditional realtors who want to list those houses right and instead of mailing postcards that are hey list your house with me or call me and start packing or any of those uh you know, personal promotion things, we start offering people the, uh, a report on uh, like the, you know, October 2020 report on Winter Haven Lakefront house prices to start the ball with somebody who's kind of moving forward, you know, what, what else would they be looking at? Do you think these guys, like what, if they're not going to sell, what, what do they need or what would be uh, uh, the answer to their problem? That, that's a great question. I've not been in that situation. So right. uh, yeah, we're, we're trying to discover that and, and figure out how can we, so we were doing the newsletter uh, and, and I thought that would be really effective. We had some, uh, you know, a lawyer writing some stuff about yeah. the statewide rent control law and yeah, but very, I mean, not, not inexpensive marketing strategy, but yeah. uh, you know, the return was not good. Yeah. Yeah. Very challenging. It is. So I, I think I would look maybe at the um, going back to the ones that you had from a year ago kind of thing when they first come on that list and just to get a sense of how, what is the scope of this? How, how, cause there it, um, what we call visible prospects, you know, you know who they are and it's, you know, likely that they're going to um, be, they're going to do something at some point. 
Yeah, our code, code enforcement eventually will get involved as well. Right. So. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, another opportunity may be to think upstream about who else is interested in, like not all distressed homes are, uh, are um, run down either. There's no visual. They're not necessarily 100% of the time um, visually distressed mm -hmm. as well, right? Absolutely. Uh, yeah. So part of the thing is I might look at aligning with a real estate agent who is also wants to get traditional listings, you know, are you a uh, licensed uh, real yeah, estate? Yeah, agent? I'm a broker. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, part of the thing is looking, you may want to attempt that, try the, our getting listings program. And then when the people reply, uh, you've got the opportunity of buying their house right there for them, or then selling those leads to, uh, to a real estate agent. Who oh, wants I have an in-house to... agent that, yeah, we do that already. Oh, you do? Okay. Yeah. Well, that's what I got. <laughs> okay. So I, I is, is, you. Aaron, is that helpful? Yeah, I, you know, I, I appreciate, you know, this, I, this is amazing that you guys are doing this. I just want to thank you very much. Been, been okay. fantastic. I love being on these calls. So yeah, thanks a lot, Dean. I, I, I really appreciate it. Awesome. Yeah. And let me always mention this too, even though we have a, you know, a podcast here called I Love Marketing, and there's so many answers on specific topics that you guys can go and listen to uh, that, are, you know, that are there for free. Um, I wish we didn't have to do any of this marketing stuff. Mm -hmm. I wish people would just do business with us because, you know, we were caring and we were, you know, kind and we delivered products and services, but, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's a very competitive world. And so the purpose of marketing is if this was easy, everybody would be rich, everyone would be doing well, and, and it just isn't. And so the more that you can uh, invest, uh, you know, marketing is applied psychology. It's what you say and who you say it to. And I have met uh, people that have mastered uh, different areas of marketing that know more about human behavior than many psychologists that I've met because they have to not just understand what people uh, do and what causes them to do the things they do, but getting someone to actually respond and to give you money and to pay attention to you. And, and so there's, there's a lot to it. So whenever you're in a highly competitive market, uh, you have to, you know, find ways to actually uh, break through. And that requires, you know, constant uh, thinking about the, um, you know, the mindset of, of the person. I mean, I, I've always liked the Robert Collier uh, line where as a, as a marketer, as a copywriter, you want to enter a conversation that's existing in the prospect's mind. And so, you know, the, the prospect has a conversation. There's something that they have their, to use a Dan Sullivan terminology, they have their dangers, they have their opportunities, and they have their strengths. And so we need to know what their dangers are. We need to know what their opportunities are, what you can bring to them and, and being able to get their attention in many ways by reinforcing their strengths. So, and if anyone, uh, this is not really a marketing book, uh, but I highly recommend it. You can get it on Amazon. It's called the Dan Sullivan question. It's all about that. Highly recommend reading that book. It's a good book. Mm -hmm. What are some strategies and tactics business owners should be thinking about using to bring in cash like right now? Well, I mean, there's a lot of different ways. Uh, one of them is most people don't think about barter. I've set up lots of things for people, but if you have something you can create or you own that you have margin in or it's sunk cost and you and it has and it has value to anybody and you can exchange it for anything that can either be cash converted used in lieu of what you buy or there's another word I don't want to get too sophisticated triangulated you can I mean, we've done geez I've done 50 60 billion dollar million dollar excuse me of barter, and I could tell you some great barter stories. The other, I've been, I've been to your house. You have a lot of art and shit there that you've bartered over the years. I mean, and this is, I mean, and truthfully, I drive a GT. I got a GTS Mercedes. I traded a day for. I got a, and I'm saying this just to demonstrate, not to be arrogant. I've got a uh, a, a G wagon 63 AMG. I traded two days for. Christy has a Porsche. We traded for. You know, my whole backyard I traded for, 
Uh, I mean, it's but but it's it's understanding value perception. If you have something that you have in oversupply expertise, for example, and that expertise has high perceived value, and you can exchange it to somebody that you can uh, you can demonstrate needs it or needs the not it because you're not really selling the expertise. You're selling the result, the saving, the money, the productivity, whatever it's going to be worth. And you can get anything. We used to do with car dealerships, just as an example, we would create <clears throat> barter profit centers. And I'll go through real quick because it's pretty cool. We would basically look at, and most people don't know it. If you have car dealers there, they know it. It's a very huge amount of, of, uh, of volume that goes through, not just volume of cars, but just buying, purchasing, you know, tens, hundreds of millions of dollars. We would go through everything they were buying. Got to keep my eyes focused on the camera. And then we would see what we could trade for instead of purchasing. But when you're trading, you can trade soft for hard on different multiples. And I don't want to get too sophisticated, but we would trade a car for two or three times the value in something else that we would normally pay cash for. So let's say we were going to buy chemicals and we needed cleaning chemicals or lubricating chemicals. We would go to that company and we'd trade them either automobiles that normally would have, let's call it a 15% margin or less, but we would trade it two or three to one. So we would get margins of something like literally 60, 70% to our advantage for something we would normally write a check for. We would also trade for things I could liquidate on the open market for a multiple, excuse me, for a higher margin. You can trade. I don't want to get too sophisticated. You can JV with people. Again, if you have anything that you sell, you should ask, what else do people buy right now, before, during, after, instead, if it's still being purchased? Then the next level is, what else are my buyers buying? And if they're buying it from people they don't know and they're just basically trying to find them anyhow, this goes back to relationships, Joe. You have the ability with the trust, the credibility that has been very hard won by the years you've served your clients or the value you brought your clients if it wasn't yours to say, look, this is, and, and, and by the way, I have a concept that's called the Aikido School of Marketing. And the essence, anybody that knows what Aikido is, it's the martial arts methodology that uses the power of the enemy against the enemy. If you use the problem to your advantage, you could say, look, uh, it's a little unusual for me to be introducing you to blank, but I know that you're going to be purchasing or using these services or products now, and you probably don't know who to trust. We've, we've built a very strong relationship where hopefully you trust us and our judgment. We've done a very, very comprehensive job, and we've found what we think are the best providers. We've negotiated in behalf of all of our clients a preferential price, extra terms, guarantees, bonuses. And if you don't know who to trust, we would like to very strongly recommend this. You can choose anybody you want, but we're also ombudsman. You can do things like that all day long, and I hope I'm not getting too rogue on you. No, you know what I what I like about what you just said. When I was a carpet cleaner back in 1990, one of the ways I came up with a free room of carpet cleaning was I heard a one of your I don't know how many thousands of dollars. You were the most expensive seminar guy in the world uh, back in the 90s when I first started listening to your stuff. I, I remember listening to one of your a first set of J. Abraham tapes in 1992 was the first time. <laughs> And uh, you had some carpet cleaners. And I think back then you were charging like three grand an hour or something. And they uh, could not afford you, these two guys that owned the carpet cleaning business. And so they scraped up $2,000 to hire you. And I think you gave them 45 minutes for two grand. And what you told them is you explain lifetime value of a, of a customer. And you are great at explaining, you know, the whole J. Abraham, you don't know how much you can afford to spend until, until and unless you know how much a client is actually worth to you. And so you would explain to them, you know, lifetime value of a customer and go out and spend a month giving away carpet cleaning for free because what will happen is you will develop reciprocity and then they will refer you and they'll do business right. with you again. And so what happened is they went to churches and they uh, trade shows and, and neighborhoods and just offered 
like an entire houses of carpet cleaning and people would tip them and they'd refer them and, and things like that. And I was like, huh, you know, so, so I was like, what if I just gave away a free room of carpet cleaning? And so I started doing that. And then I created a thing called a carpet audit because I didn't want to do a free co- quote. I wanted to do something different. And I developed this system for myself. And then I went to a dry cleaner of clothing was my first joint venture who was already had a developed a relationship with people that were bringing their clothing. And I said, can I clean the carpets in your house or your, uh, or your uh, dry cleaner here uh, to show you the, the services I do? And if you like it, then can we talk about offering services to your clients? Because I wanted him to see my, uh, you know, my, my services. And so he agreed to let me do his, uh, the store. And so I cleaned the front entrance. It wasn't a ton of carpet, but it was the front entrance to this dry cleaner. Now what happened is I instilled reciprocity. But then over, uh, over like the first year, uh, he referred me and I gave him 10% uh, commission of every job that I did. And, and uh, he referred $25,000 worth of business to me that year. Uh, and what my offer was, was a free room of carpet cleaning to all his clients. And another thing that I learned through you is that if you offer someone a gift, even if they do not avail themselves of it, you still get the benefit of the reciprocity by giving, and, and you genuinely do it. You don't want to do it as a gimmick. You, I mean, no. if you're offering something to someone, you give it to them, right? And so what ended up happening was all of these people that stopped going to this dry cleaner, I asked after I did a few jobs and people reported back, I was like, can I have your list? And I will call them. I will physically, there was no internet back then. Yeah. This was like, literally manual marketing, right? And putting postcards and signs on his store. I even uh, got him to put little door hangers over the clothing that said, you know, ask us about our free carpet cleaning. But here's the point as it relates to everybody is I then started teaching carpet cleaners to go out and say, they're going to hire a landscaper, a pool cleaner, an electrician, a painter, a pest control company, all of these, you know, asphalt, like everything uh, you know, and they're going to, you have a relationship with them, you know, different service businesses. And the fact is like, why is your interior designer writing to you about a carpet cleaner? Why is your carpet cleaning writing to you about a real estate agent? And all of a sudden it became this whole joint venture thing. And so every time one of my carpet cleaners wanted to add another hundred grand to their business, I would say, who is the joint venture or refer that you can develop and establish a relationship with that can refer that business to you. And right now, that opportunity, I think, exists in greater levels than ever before because, you know, there's this anxiety and there's all these people trying to figure out. And and many of the comments that people have posted here with these ideas, I mean, I think that's just a way to look at it. And I only bring this up because I was a dead broke carpet cleaner that was just trying to figure out how to learn marketing, still doing the carpet cleaning myself, and I still manage to build and grow my business doing all this sort of stuff. And now with that level of knowledge and, and how easy it is with the internet and in the, in the spreading of messages, uh, there's just such a, a great, and the need of it is such a great opportunity. A year ago or so, hardly anyone had even heard of Periscope or Meerkat or Blab or Facebook mentions. And right now we all have this portable television studio in our pockets and we could broadcast to the entire connected planet for free and build an audience. And what we're going to talk about today is about owning time, which is really the most valuable asset that we have in our lives. And it starts with a little story. About 15 years ago, I was in Palm Desert with my then pregnant wife, Vivian. She walked into a little shop. I called a friend of mine. His name is Merlin Quiggle. I kid you not, that poor man. And Merlin is a producer. He produces all sorts of events, and he's been doing marketing for about 30 years. I said, hey, Merlin, what are you doing? He says, I'm out buying Rolex watches, three of them, for people who are responsible for giving me all the business I've had for my 25-year career. I said, that's a really nice gift. Why are you giving them a Rolex watch? And he said, who do you think they're going to think of every time they check the time? I slapped my head, and I thought, that was one of the smartest things I've ever heard. I don't know if you know this, but do you know how many times the average person checks their phone every day? Okay, the average is 150 times. And if you think about it, if you add up the number of times that people check their phones, their watches, their desktop, laptop computers, tablets, or watch their interactive televisions, it's incredible. They are trading and giving their time, and more importantly, 
Apple One, they're almost worth a trillion dollars right now, right? It's because they own your time, they own your mind, they own your wrist, they own your bathroom, bedroom experience, your car experience. So what we're talking about today is how to be seen, heard, viewed, listened to anytime, anywhere, on demand, on any device. Because that's the business we're all in. And I like to think of it as, if you can own someone's pocket in their bedroom and bathroom, something is happening. It's very, very powerful. So right now, there's roughly 300 million interactive televisions in use. If you add up Apple TVs and all the doodads and gadgets that are connecting to TVs these days, roughly 2 billion tablet devices, 3 billion internet-connected laptop and desktop computers, and we're at about 7 billion or more, growing very, very quickly the number of internet-connected accounts. Most of us have 6 to 25 internet-connected devices in our homes today. Okay, That's after just doing a lot of surveying. So the next thing, oh, and there's about 4 billion smartphones that are being sold every two years. That's actually according to Peter. So if you think about the level of access we have to multi-trillion dollar infrastructures and brands that are willing to broadcast your message across multiple channels to any device, anytime on demand, the question is, what do you need to do to stand out and be in front of all those people? So again, look at all these brands. You got the most valuable brands in the world are willing to broadcast and distribute your content free of charge, giving you access to their customers. So if you think about it, and this is the way I think about it right now, we are all in the education and entertainment business, and those who take advantage of disruptive technologies first are the winners, historically. And you look at some of our entertainers up here, all of them have figured out how to own time. So the question is, how are we gonna take advantage of that as marketers or business owners or people who wanna change the world? One of my goals is to create a million entrepreneurs before I passed, and as of almost three years ago to this day, I finished my very last cancer treatment. So I'm lucky to be alive, and I came back with a new vision, a very, very, I just wanted to do this. This is what charges me up, and I think there's a renaissance going on right now. We have the ability to broadcast a message. Why not do great things? Why not create immense wealth using entrepreneurship as the model? So if you think about the evolution of marketing feedback, the challenge is, how do you get as much feedback as possible so you can change and refine your message? If you think about direct marketing, direct mail, it used to take a couple of weeks or months because you'd have to write your letters and send them out and wait and see what the response was. Now, if you just advance your radio and commercials, social media, ads, et cetera, et cetera, we can do it quickly, but now it's possible to do it in seconds. And that, the big idea is feedback-driven intimacy. The faster you speed the process of gaining trust, the more time you own. It's just a matter of time before someone will want to buy from you. To say, I like this person, I think they can help me, and I want to connect with them. I know they've got a tool or a resource. I got that from Bill Harris originally. I kind of messed it up right now. It's, I like this person. They really know what they're talking about, and I think they can help me. There you go. So <clears throat> what's the solution? Well, it's webcasts. Now, a few years ago, in about 2009, we started experimenting with these. These are live, online, interactive broadcasts. The opportunity to broadcast video, interact with an audience through chat, be able to say, hey, share this online, and click a button to buy, or we could actually create products these ways. Back then, it cost twenty dollars to $30,000 to do a show. Now you can do it with Google Hangouts for free, or Blab, or any of these other tools, and create a very, very rapidly engaged audience just by talking to them. And whether you're talking to one or five or 50 or 500 or 5,000 or 500,000 people, which you can do for free, you can create this feedback loop through chat and actually read the minds of your audience in real time. So the way we've been using it and teaching a lot of other entrepreneurs how to do it, and just think about this, again, I think a renaissance is about to occur. Television production is going to change dramatically because of this technology. It's going to radically change education too. So what we started doing is this notion of something called You Everywhere Now. So if you can create content once and distribute it in real time to as many devices as possible, the notion is you could perform your content as an educator or as an entertainer, 
You could convert it very quickly into a video and distribute it on the major video sites, chop it up into chunks. You could also turn it into a podcast. You could save it as an audio. You could save it as a video. We've also started converting that content into books, putting them on Amazon and taking advantage of that channel. What we find is that someone that watches a live video is gonna be different than someone who watches a podcast or listens to a podcast or reads a book or a paperback book. Same content created over and over again. Then we can put it and create podcasts, one of the, or products rather. One of the strategies we've used is we will perform a product live, interactively, getting feedback and adjusting our approach and saving that in a membership site in real time. We're able to create a documentary in real time as well, and we've seen other people start using the strategy over and over again. Then you distribute to social sites, same content, repurpose, reuse to blogs, and also it helps you get attention in the traditional media as well. So again, create once, distribute everywhere, any device on demand. We've been calling this the you everywhere now uh, strategy or approach. So I want to show you something I call the intimacy dashboard because the question is, what do you need so you can read the minds and build an intimate relationship as quickly as possible with this engaged audience? So this is one of my studios. It's a whole bunch of monitors. The good news is you don't have to have all this fancy equipment to make this work yourself if you're using something like Google Hangouts, but we've broken it down into what tools you need to read this information quickly. So we have a timer, make sure we're on track a presentation prompter, cameras above it so we can look at the screen and see what we're about to present. Maybe you've got a keynote presentation, you've got some notes, your next and previous slide, a monitor so you can see what the audience sees. But here's where things get interesting. Using a Google Doc, I have a producer who's typing notes and telling me what people are saying in real time, keeping me on track. So you only need one assistant to do this. Sometimes I have team chat, my technical team, saying, here's what's going on, the shopping cart's down, wait for a little while, delay, all right? Then the stats, so I know how many people are watching, how many people are in checkout when I say click the orange buy button, how many people are buying so I can acknowledge the people who are investing in real time, and finally the viewer chat. This is the hub of everything because I can ask a question, get feedback immediately, adjust the presentation, adjust the approach. So, quick st study. JJ Virgin, got to talk about her. She's my sister from another mother. Um, we started doing podcasts together, or rather webcasts. She's had multiple six-figure days. New York Times bestseller status. We're converting on shows that last seven to eight and a half hours. Most people say that's impossible. They stay, they watch, and they buy, converting 38 to 52% of the average viewers into buyers because they're engaging intimate conversations. And the most important thing that JJ said to me is, look, I learn more about my audience in two hours than I have in 10 years doing surveys as a result of doing webcasts. We've also put this together, a combination of a PBS special with a TED Talk, nine presenters all together, Dave Asprey, Elizabeth Lombardo, performing, cooking, bringing on guests, and the results, 30,000 opt-ins, 9,000 viewers peak, an average of 5,400, but here's where things got interesting. Almost half the viewers bought the product because they felt like they had an intimate relationship with J.J. Virgin. Okay, and the other viewers. And in a replay with live chat, people think and feel, and this is done completely transparently, no shenanigans going on, they are still interacting with the host because someone is interacting with them live with chat, able to replay that over and over again. The long format, eight and a half hour shows, people said, this is crazy, who's gonna stick around? Almost 40% of the average viewers stick around to the end. And we started a health network as a result of this. John Assaraf's also used the same thing, recording weekly evergreen webcasts that play over and over again. He's producing a million to two million in sales with a cold audience. So saying that, you know, you do some really effective marketing in Wild Thing Seafood, but yeah. you also do some unique things. You go in and you actually train your vendors. You, mm -hmm. you know, you do all kinds of stuff and I don't wanna, I mean, you can name names if you want, but I don't wanna, you know, speak, but I'd like you to kind of walk people through what you do and how you do it. What have you done that has been a game changer, that has made you money, that has created bonding and relationship and engagement with your clients? And what are some mistakes that you've done? I'd, I'd love to cover both of those in our conversation today. Just, you know, let's talk about some best practices, some best strategies, and let's talk about some lessons. Well, uh, first and foremost, um, 
the money making thing, uh, there's things that have made us money in, in the past, and to me, completely unsatisfactory to my level of, of expectation. Uh, as far as what I've learned, what I've implemented, what I've done, um, I, I first and foremost, I don't know if it, it's, it's it, I just grew up with this, but I sincerely have, and, and you know this too, a, a genuine, authentic love for people and the energy, like a positive energy thing. Right. And I love to make people feel that they can achieve new things. Uh, I like to be out of the box, I'm an out of the box thinker, but I like to be that intimacy thing goes back. I think that one of the first kind of engagements that we had was I was sending you over some seafood so I could mm -hmm. introduce my company. And instead of just sending you over seafood and go, hey, check this stuff out, you know, Jeff Moore or whatever, I went into a conference room and I I knew what all of your, your team, what their favorite type of seafood was. Mm -hmm. And I went in, put a flip cam up on a deal and started talking to that camera. It's about 11 minute video, talked about the seafood, where it came from, yeah. made fun of you, which is mm -hmm. always a lot of fun to do. Yeah, and um, <laughs> But just gave everything. And I remember the response that you had was like, you could do this as you know like a consumer awareness guide and it's like right I do this all the time anyway mm -hmm. and so that really kind of hit for me and when we did this gourmet giveaway which is a completely untargeted and and not you know the way I want it to go as far as wild things but everybody that ordered in wild things when we built this list of 2,000 people over the last few months of people that have ordered our seafood everybody got a video from me and at first, it was me like, hey, Rakeem, man, thanks. You know, I saw that you ordered this. I absolutely love what you ordered. You ordered the Wild King Salmon. I want you to know that this is caught hook and line off the boats of, of Southeast Alaska. And, you know, and I would explain it. And I'd explain what's going on and how we believe that um, the best way for us to, to share our, uh, our experience is to give it away for free. And that's exactly what we're doing. I mean, there was a thing, but I used their name. And right. it was like, whoa. But then that became, and as I'm sharing it and talking to Dean about it, he's like, when <laughs> when does this become a thing when you get 2,000 orders in a day? And I'm like, right. so then I started to do it, not with the name, but make it still very personal and look in the camera and things. And that was convertible, but not nearly as exciting as when you use somebody's name in it. And so I learned that, that you know, to be able to do that. And then everybody's, I'm starting to get people in these, in the breakthrough mastermind deal saying, you know, have, just have, record a bunch of names and stick it in there. That's just so not me. You know, it's the connection, it's the energy. It's the thing on Thanksgiving day, when I look at my text and it's you and Renee hiking mm -hmm. and you're saying, I don't even know what you eat on Thanksgiving. You know, okay, is it seafood? Is it what, you know, what is it? That meant the world to me. And if I know that that means the world to me, I'm sure that's special to everybody. And, right. and I know that, you know, as far as a network, as far as you're not building a network of people because you have this thing in your mind going, network, network is good, network good. No, you love people. Mm -hmm. You like connecting people. You like helping people. And to me, I think that that is the ultimate. To become somebody's trusted advisor, to become their friend and trusted advisor, to me is the ultimate position that I can have, whether it's with my business, whether it's my family, mm -hmm. you know, my friends, anything is something that really gets me going. I started my mastermind group, uh, Thursday Night Boardroom, um, because I had all this video and mm -hmm. I just wanted to share it. And then it just all of a sudden is built into this group that's got 90 members in it, you know, and they all come every other Thursday and they don't, 90 don't come, thank God. But, you know, it's that love of people, that energy that we get from people. But seeing the stuff that you've done, seeing the power of the mastermind. I'm just going to fumble around with this pen here while you talk. That you, the power of the mastermind that, that you taught me, and that was the thing that we did uh, last year, was I worked with a major broadline distributor, and I'm a tiny, tiny bit of this broadline distributor. I'm $25 million. They are a $42 billion corporation. So, I mean, they're doing $2.2 billion worth of seafood. I can't even, you know, they can't get the janitor to open the back door for me. But as I started to look at the power of the mastermind and bringing a group together that has, you know, similar thoughts and similar passions, I put a mastermind group together of six suppliers, we call the gang of six. And, um, and 
we put this group together. We met at this distributor's home office with all their executives going, what are these guys doing? And all of a sudden, I was able to put this mastermind group together of suppliers, and, and some of them competitive suppliers, where I had to kind of keep the glue. I was the glue that kept right. it together. And it was a two-day mastermind. And now I'm running a mastermind group of suppliers that act as one, and it's a $650 million group. Not just a $25 million group. So I learned that at Platinum. Uh, I, I learned that bringing like minds together is just as powerful as things can be. But just the engagement part, really being sensitive. I think uh, Wyatt Woodsmall was the guy that said, when you can articulate the needs, desires, challenges, fears, and aspirations of the other person, not better than they can to themselves, but better than, not better than they can to you, but better than they can to themselves, right. you have passed the tipping point of becoming that person's trusted advisor for life. And then all you have to do is continue to add value to the relationship and they will eagerly receive it for life. And I was like, you know, that's my motto. You know, right. I have another one that's learn to teach, teach to know, know and share and share with passion. Hmm. And that one's like a bumper sticker over my door, but it's every breath I take. You know, it's stuff it just, and I think that you're probably, I, I would, I know you're this person. You're learning something, not for the consumption of Joe Polish. But you're literally, you can't, as, an, as, a, as a guy with ADD, you can't learn stuff for the consumption of Joe Polish. You are literally listening to this saying, I'm going to share this with Peter. I'm going to share this with, with Dean. I'm going to share this with Jeff. I'm going to share this with somebody. You're learning it, and you're obligated to learn it on behalf of somebody else. And yeah. I think that that, yeah. to me, has always been a big driver for me. Um, again, making money on this stuff, I think that that you you can get so big and grandiose. I was telling these these stories to Jay Abraham, and he's like, man, these are all great ideas, but can you assign a dollar figure to it? Well, no, 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 no. And he stopped me. He goes, this is going to sound really weird coming from me. And I said, what? He goes, if you can't assign a dollar figure to your activities and these, these really cool plans and this way to bring people together, he goes, you have a business plan based in arrogance because mm. this is now about you and it's not about what you're driving. And so at that very lunch, I learned that all business since the beginning of business ever has one overriding purpose. Take away all the, 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 the fancy stuff and all that kind of stuff. Every business has one overriding purpose and that is to drive new, increased and or more profitable consumption of our product or service. And if that is irrefutable, and we understand that that is it, then at the core, we all share a basic common language. Hmm. And so I had a meeting today down the street here with a, a big time VP at this place, and we talked about that. And then we were able to talk about the three challenges. And then I was able to even pull out the R question, you know, and use that. And this meeting, I left and my VP was with me that I took to the airport before I came back here, he goes, man he goes i'm your biggest fan and he goes that was the best i've ever seen and i'm like literally as a lifelong learner i'm able in my mind to go that was i love marketing episode 111 <laughs> that was uh that was the uh 10x talk deal from this one right. this was this and i'm able to catalog this stuff but i learned it to share it that's great and that's been that's been probably the best thing is to learn it to share it yeah you know and uh, i mean part of it too is i think uh which is hard for some people is you always focus on the mindset of the person that you're selling and what the hell is it that they want? I mean, you're not, Absolutely. you know, I, I don't hear you constantly talking about, you know, your seafood and mm -hmm. where it comes from. Or I, I mean, you know all that stuff. And right. Those are features. But I mean, you're, you're always thinking about what's in it for them. Mm -hmm. And as much as a skilled marketer kind of gets that and understands that, a yeah. lot of people, they... They got things to sell, and they're constantly thinking about what, why they need to sell it for themselves, not you know what value, you know, can people give them, not what value can they give other people. It well, yeah, and and I think that from from that point, and and again, this is something that I learned from you. I learned it from Evan. I learned it from Core Influence from Frank. Um, the, on the back of my card, I was talking. Uh, there's five questions, mm -hmm. and. These questions, everybody's like, oh, they're seafood questions. This is a different card. But yeah. these, are, these are seafood questions? And I said, no. There are five questions that when we ask these questions, 
from every single customer we meet is we find out that 75% of the time the customer is not using the best available option in their restaurant, no matter how accomplished the chef is. Mm -hmm. And over the last six years, we've saved the restaurant operator three and a half million dollars in annual food costs just by asking these questions. These questions have nothing to do with seafood and everything to do with the customer. It's funny, there's a story back in uh, uh, 2011, I'm at Experts Academy. Mm -hmm. And I'm talking to David Bach, who I'm a big fan of, and the guy that encouraged you to buy this building, you know, all that stuff. He tries to uh, take credit for that. He does. Well, he no. did it in the Genius interview, too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, um, and, uh, uh, oh, God, you know what? I just remembered how I uh, connected with you, and I'll, I'll, I just remembered it now. Good. Yeah, fantastic. We had a conversation prior to this recording saying, how the hell did you come into my world? So yeah, it was, it's still, but the, it's a good story, though. And it's about walking your talk, too, by the way. It's, it's fabulous. Oh, good. So I, I give my card to, to uh, uh, David. David, Jesus. <laughs> give my card to David Bach. You know, it's hard to remember his name. He's only got 12 New York Times bestsellers. Um, and I hand him my card and he goes, what are these questions on the back? And I go, those are the questions I ask every single customer when I meet him. And he goes, this is genius. Well, you know, I don't see, like genius to me is like the great kazoo on the Flintstones with the big head and all right. that kind of stuff. I'm like, dude, I said genius, just so I don't forget the questions, you know? And he goes, I have seven questions I ask every prospective client. He goes, why aren't those on the back of my card? Yeah. I go, I don't know. He goes, is it okay if I put my questions on the back of my card? And That's I'm like, funny. yes. <laughs> For a license, you feel. <laughs> yeah, it's like it's not prior art, buddy. You know, and he's just like, and we had a great conversation, and we talked about the stickiness of coaching, and you, you were just talking about. And he goes, yeah. "What would you suggest?" He goes, "I'm going through a change in, in my coaching," and I said, "You know, you hire somebody, and you've got this program that works works for people that do it." And he goes, "Right." I go, "So you know it works?" He goes, "Right." I go, "Where are the people when you give them that program?" And he goes. What do you mean? I go, where are they mentally? I go, you could explain this this great program and what it's going to do for them. You know, mm -hmm. P90X, what it's going to do for you, right. right? Losing weight. It's not about losing weight. It's not about any of this stuff. It's about the things you have to do. And I go, David, when you hand them this program and this coaching program and stuff, they might not be ready for it. And so they might be thinking you're building this big you know, entertainment center, cool thing that's going to have my TVs and my whatever in there and all this kind of stuff. But all of a sudden you show up and you give them a box from Ikea that they have to build themselves. They're not there yet. It's right. going to stay there. And so it's meeting the customer where they are. Yeah. No matter what very, you've got. Very good point. Boom. Get them there and say, oh, hey, look, see that brown thing? Don't step on it. Mm -hmm. It's going to make your shoe smell. Right. And then you keep going. And so it's like meeting customers where they are is without a doubt the greatest marketing strategy. But again, you can't fake that. You can't right. walk in there and you can't, Mom, I'm here to meet you. I I care about you. It's like, say that shit, man. Right, right, right. Well, and the beauty of <clears throat> technology, I think one of the advantages, uh, there's many disadvantages of over-communication. <laughs> uh, you know, I think uh, most people don't admit uh, just how much of a complexity keeping up with email and all of the different right. eye candy that's available, you know, from a million different sources. Oh, yeah. There's so much interesting stuff out there. Um, the, the one thing is, like, it's harder these days to be a fraud. It's harder to deliver crappy service right. and not get found out quickly because of reviews, mm -hmm. because of how people talk. So I, I, I think keeping things in check. And I was just in Costa Rica. I've got right. quite a few mosquito bites on me right now. And it was interesting because we would go out to, uh, we, a couple of times we went out to a restaurant so that we had a full staff of people waiting on us hand and foot and they were amazing people and the food they were making was awesome. But anyway, we, we went out um, in this little town um, and most people are on island time. I mean, they're just... Yeah, taking no forever to greet you, taking forever to bring you menus, taking forever to, you know, everything. Like, they're very slow. This is Joe on free days going, TikTok! <laughs> <laughs> no, but I'm saying, like, it, it would be like free weeks if you waited. You know, it, yeah. it, like, took a long time. And I, and I made this comment to Renee. I said, you know, I go, um, and how many, we, there were like four different places that, like, supposedly had credit card machines, but they were broken. <laughs> I'm like, you all have smartphones, get square. I mean, yeah, you know, how hard is exactly. this, right? 
And the, the, the thing I was, I was like going, you know, um, so there are places where it doesn't matter. You can right. still, you know, have to be like fabulous. But the, 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 the analogy I came out of it is like, if, if there was anyone, and I'm sure they're there, but I, we didn't experience any of this, where they literally just served people quickly. Like they would greet them. They had their act together. They had like anywhere near like just a four season service attitude. How they would just dominate. I think, you know, maybe not. They'd be called a foreigner. (laughs) (laughs) You're not here. Get out. Yeah, but, but you know, it it was also, but, but the point I made is like, you know, in business, you don't have to be like the best in the world. You simply sometimes just have to show up. You just have to be a little bit better than oh. your competitors. And what I'm always surprised by is that a lot of people in business, they act as if it's so damn difficult to deliver a good service. Yep. It really isn't. No, I mean, most people suck. I mean, you know. It's so funny. You talk about being just a little bit better than the next guy. I have a friend that's in our mastermind group, and he is a hugely successful attorney. I mean, seven-figure guy. He's never worked more than 25 hours a week. So we got names for them, and they're not they're not happy names. Right. But his whole thing, ever since he was in college, was I'm just going to be 10 percent better than the average guy. And it's like right. He could, and and in that he became the best in the world at what he does. But it was just that. And you're right. It's just it's it's this is you want to be served the way you want to be served. I want to be communicated in a way that that it's it's compelling as Dean will use. And I think that they're all prepositions, but it's at to or with. Yeah. And it's like, are you talking at them, to them, or with them? And at them gets clicked, deleted. Mm-hmm. Two is like, if this is important, yeah, I'll probably read it. With, it's like, oh man, I got an email from Joe. Cool, man, what's going on? Okay, cool. You know, or or hey, this didn't come from Joe, but it came from Rochelle. But you know what? I like what he's doing here. Yeah. And it's yeah. so it's at to or with. And it's like reviewing your copy and saying, is this at to or with? You know, the thing that drives me crazy is when people send an email to somebody and say everyone, and they use this big third person right. crowd thing. Those emails, you might send a million emails out, but those are all one at a time conversations. Don't treat them like you're standing yeah. on a stage. Yeah, exactly. At to or with, what, where is this communication? Yeah. Things. I'm sure there's lots of examples of that we don't know about the same product in I have a, a couple of versions you do I knew it tell me um Morton salt is okay. literally the exact same product as generic salt if you send it to a lab they can't tell the difference but Morton's able to charge 187 percent more I love it um I did an experiment to try to understand what is a commodity when somebody buys a commodity product yeah. um w- are they paying more when that when 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 two things that are exactly the same and they're willing to pay more for one mm-hmm. we, are they paying for the brand or are they paying for their perception of the product mm-hmm. so to test this I um I gave people two pairs of sunglasses that were exactly the same I said uh okay one pair had no logo and the other pair had a Chanel logo. And Mm -hmm. I said, how much would you be willing to pay for for these two glasses? And they were willing to pay 400% more for the pair with Chanel logo, which means they were buying sunglasses, but they were paying for their perception of the product or more importantly, how other people would perceive them. Yeah. So the, the 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 way this relates to um, to entrepreneurs, to, to small business owners, to leaders is you it, it's about it's about the perception that you're creating on your differentiation. And there's no mm-hmm. one right way to differentiate in the speaking speaking world. When I started, I couldn't figure out what's the correlation between a speaking fee and how much that speaker is willing to charge. Mm-hmm. Is it reputation? Is it reviews? Is it mm-hmm. connections? Um, status. And so I, 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 I looked at top speakers um, and on, on speaking sites, there's a drop down menu, just like Amazon. And um, you know, which category are you looking for right. in, yeah, yeah. In, in speaking? The category is um, economics, politics, yeah. comedy. And what I found was that speakers who used the word innovation to describe their topic made on average $5,000 more per keynote than speakers who used the category creativity. Oh, wow. 
So, you know, uh, innovation and creativity, you could take the yeah. same speech and simply change the word, but innovation had a much higher perception because mm -hmm. innovation is a means to an end, whereas creativity is perceived as a process that doesn't necessarily have a benefit. Mm -hmm. Boy, that's really, that is interesting. And so that's, you know, it, it's an example of different, at how to make your product uh, by, 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 by uh, a, a very subtle nuance the mm -hmm. product becomes different, which thereby makes it be perceived as better through marketing. I love it. I love it. I'm, I want to see um, what kind of questions maybe people can, have. Can I, hey, wanna... Dean, can I get in this conversation real briefly? Or, hey, or... Jim. Hi, Sally. It's so nice. Hi. Oh, special really you are a being catfish right now. <laughs> So, so first of all, Sally, uh, I was going to introduce you on this and I got yeah. delayed flying and I'm such a, a huge fan mm. of everything you do. You know, it's probably, what was it, Sally, three or four years ago at a Genius Network annual event, you were on the stage with uh, a panel of, of female spectacular entrepreneurs, you, JJ Virgin and Kellyanne. Robin Pichu, Roberts, Lisa Robin, Sosevich. Oh my gosh, Robin. Mm. Lisa, that's right. But I, I heard you say, and your book title is a little different than I remember, the, your, but you said, it's better to be different than it is to be better. And mm. that was like the highlight for me for that annual event. I wrote it down. I've quoted you so many times mm. since that time. But here's one that it, kind of a case study, Sally, I'd love for you to comment about. So back in the 20th century, I worked... <laughs> That's kind of funny to put it that way. Yeah. I worked for Hair Club for Men. I was actually, I became a vice president of Hair Club for Men. And when I joined them, they were doing about $8 million a year. Then we took it to $120 million a year. So, so we did well. But Cy Sperling, 1976, he says, I want to get into the, the hairpiece business. Hairpiece business. And it was a commodity. Dean's hairpieces, Schwa's wigs. Russ's toupees, it was all the same. And Cy Sperling comes along and he says, uh, he, he was selling the exact same thing, but he called his company Hair Club for Men. Mm -hmm. So that was the first thing. That was the first thing, Hair Club for Men. And Cy didn't call it Schwa's wigs or Dean's toupees or Russ's uh, hair pieces. He called it the strand by strand method. Mm. Mm. It was the same thing. But he called it, he named it, he, a unique um, uh, pack, uh, let's see, what does Dan Sullivan say? Unique naming process, right? Mm -hmm. And then Schwa's wigs and Dean's toupees and Russ's hair pieces, they sell for $500. Size strand by strand system, he sold for between $2,500 and $4,000. So, and people flocked to it. Oh my goodness, they would go from states away, they would come to get the strand by strand method. Now, by the time I joined the company, they, they, they were different and better. They used a lot of that money in research and development and made something that was better than a hairpiece. But, but when I think of what you're talking about, and I, I think of this case study, um, he, he entered a commodity, but he named his company really well, I think, you can comment. He, he called it something different, gave it a unique trademark name, and he priced it on a high level, and, and it became a, an incredibly successful company. That's a great example. And uh, you know, if you think of certs with Retson, well, yes. there's no such thing as Retson. Um, the Pons Institute, there's no Pons Institute, there's women in lab coats. We, yeah. we, we did- Wait uh, a some... second, wait a second, it <laughs> blew my mind. I thought there was yeah. a Pons Institute. Yeah, there's, yeah. Let, let's let let's Google the address and go visit. Oh, yeah. and it's going to be on Madison <laughs> Avenue. So they do and, tours. Yeah. Yeah. Within uh within within my company, how to fascinate. We had a lot of people who wanted to be affiliates to be able to um to train and to coach, and uh and when we thought of them as affiliates, it was sort of like they were they were customers. They were mm -hmm. they, and so we created the Fascinate Certified Advisor Program with certification and now because we made it a thing with a program and with steps now it uh we were it, we we've certified over 200 people um it's it, it's been required in singapore the government pays for it there are dozens of them in 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 germany and in 
countries all over the world. And what that comes back to is that when you take something that's an abstract process or you take something that doesn't have a clear uh, a clear benefit and with with subtle changes, um, you can you can make it ownable. You can make it not only trademarkable, but we we just got our um, international coaching federation um uh approval which which is incredibly exciting for us because now it means oh. that yeah so now now our um our trainers and coaches are coming from that pool That's so awesome. uh, yeah i encourage i encourage all of us to be thinking about what is something that you're already doing right that you're not getting credit for mm -hmm. because you either haven't um, you, it, you you haven't named it but you haven't done what tim said strand by strand is a way of taking taking a look at something that's happening as part of a process that's a commoditized process, but um, but looking at it through through the eyes of the consumer, and that consumer wants a strand by strand process. They just it, 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 they don't know uh, they wouldn't know how they're they wouldn't be able to understand the benefit to them through uh, through what other people were doing in that category. So that's a great example, Tim. That's awesome. Thank you. You know, I always say that's that that was uh if you remember how he sold that was a different strategy too. That I remember seeing uh because that's right around the time I met you, Tim. It was 1997-ish, yes. 98, maybe. Yeah. Um, and at the time he was running infomercials and mm. uh saying how he got the idea from the cell phone industry where they give people the cell phone when you buy the plan, the, the, uh, the ongoing plan. And it was the same for them. They would give you the hair, which has the value, and you sign up for, because every month you have to go and get it uh, adjusted or tightened. Is that what they would yeah, call it? We, we would say adjusted. Thank adjusted, you not much. tightened, but they weave <laughs> it into your hair. And as your hair grows, it gets it, it loosens, and you've got to batten down the hatches. I guess. <laughs> yeah, that's that's the terminology consumers are thinking. <laughs> that's of, I'm the sure, terminology. Dean. Immediately, yeah. in my mind, I immediately conceived of it. I'm going to share it here. World premiere. I've I've carried this around. I've told a select group of people individually in private conversations about my movie idea that that inspired, and I'm going to reveal it here in case anybody has the ability to help us get this movie made. So in my mind, as he's explaining this, I thought that's brilliant because once people get the hair, they're going to want to keep the hair. So I bet that their hair payment, they make the payment, they continue on with the process. I bet the lifetime value of a client is very high. And then I thought, but what if they don't pay? What happens then? Mm. Do they come and pull the plugs? <laughs> Do they come and like repossess the hair? How does that happen? And that immediately led me to this culture and underworld of these hair repossessors that work out of back of the barber shop kind of thing, like a straight out of a Quentin Tarantino movie. I like repo. That, and that I thought about doing a part documentary, mockumentary of this world of these people, but then it evolved into tying it into sort of a weekend of, at Bernie's kind of example <laughs> of this political candidate who's running for office, but he didn't make his hair payments. And they're going to pull the plugs on him while he's on the campaign. Literally pull well, the plugs. Cracking him down and they're going to pull the plugs like the uh, hair repo men. Hmm. So there's my uh, 30 second elevator wow. pitch for the movie. If anybody would uh, like to collaborate. I want to introduce... First and foremost, what is a quiz funnel exactly? Share an example of a quiz funnel in action. Talk a little bit about why quiz funnels are so powerful, why they work so well, and uh, give you kind of a brief sort of homework assignment to be thinking about, to get your creative juices flowing and think about how you might consider using this strategy in your business uh, this year. So with that said, I'm gonna jump in by first showing an example of what a quiz funnel is. Here's an example, this one's kind of meta. Um, this is an example of a quiz funnel. So a quiz funnel in a nutshell is when someone lands on your website, instead of trying to sell them in a one size fits all way, you begin by asking a series of questions to better understand their circumstances and situation so you can ultimately better sell and better serve. 
And this is an example of it in action. Um, now, Aaron and Jocelyn literally just talked about an example of a quiz funnel with the relationship type assessment, which was, I was smiling from ear to ear um, because I don't know about you, but when I heard them bring that up, my ears sort of perked up and I thought to myself, what type am I? Like, <laughs> I, wanna, I wanna know. And that's the reason why this strategy is so effective. It's incredibly curiosity inducing to tap into this power of self-discovery. It doesn't matter if you're a financial planner, if you are an attorney, it doesn't matter if you're a consultant, it doesn't matter really what your business is all about. The thing that people care more about than anything else is themselves. Tell me more about me, right? Um, and that's what this strategy taps into. So here's an example of a quiz funnel in action. Um, you can see here, this one's kind of meta. It's a quiz to help determine what type of funnel is right for your business. So imagine you have a version of this in uh, your business. It's a starting point, it's an entry point when someone gets into your world. And based on this information, you ask a series of questions to better understand that person's situation so that with this information, you can ultimately give them a recommendation that leads them down the path of working with you. So in this case here, what type of funnel is right for you? The type of funnel that's right for you is what we call DPQF. What does that mean exactly? And how does that work? Well, enter your email address here for a free report and template for this funnel in action. And by the way, if you want to um, see this funnel, if you want to play around with it and, and go through it and spend some time kind of uh, dissecting it, you can go to the link takethefunnelquiz.com. So takethefunnelquiz.com. If you want to write that down, you can check it out at your uh, leisure. So this is an example of a quiz funnel in action. What I want to do now is actually want to switch gears. I want to go to my uh, iPad here. And I wanna walk through a few key things to be thinking about and hopefully um, a few concepts that are get, gonna get you really excited. So um, that's just one uh, quiz funnel. Um, we've been doing quizzes for years. Uh, as Tim mentioned, we have a software platform that um, uh, we have over 30 million um, end users, over 200 million data points every single year. Uh, so we have access to a tremendous amount of data around what makes this strategy work so well, what are the nuances, what are the details behind it? We're going to cover a lot of that in our training next month. But that quiz funnel that I just showed you on the screen, I want to put some numbers up here. That quiz funnel that I just showed you a few moments ago was responsible for this year generating $8.59 million in 55 days. Now, the reason for that is because of what we're going to be talking about here and why this strategy is so effective. So if we just kind of look at these numbers for a minute, I want to dissect why that strategy works so well and specifically why quizzes in general. So let's take a look here. And by the way, you may want to take notes as I kind of go through this. Um, uh, there are a few concepts that might be helpful to have some notes on. So first and foremost, um, let's answer the question, why quiz? If I go a little bit skinnier here, let's try this. Why quiz? Well, we already talked about what's in it for your customer. It's incredibly uh, uh, powerful to tap into that, 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 that self-interest, that power of self-discovery. But there are three reasons from your perspective why a quiz funnel is so incredibly powerful, beginning with reason number one. Reason number one is that quizzes produce incredibly cheap leads. And I'll explain the reason behind this in just a minute. But just to give you some perspective, when I say cheap leads, that funnel that I just shared with you, to put things in perspective, um, when we generate leads in our business for the product that we sell um, uh, on the back of that quiz, um, we pay right now as we speak $5.23 per lead on paid media across all paid media. So Facebook, YouTube, Google, and so on and so forth. On the back of that quiz, we've been able to take our cost per lead down from $5.23 to $0.47. Cents. Now, you might be asking yourself, how are you able to cut your cost per lead down by as much as 90%? Well, the answer has to do with a few different, fa different factors. See, first and foremost, quizzes are incredibly engaging. Quizzes are one of these things that cause people to comment on them, to share them with their friends. So when you're advertising on a platform like Facebook, when Facebook sees a ton of engagement in your ads, in your sponsored posts, Facebook rewards you for that. They, they reduce your CPM, your cost 
uh, basically for traffic on the platform. And so because of that, you're able to drop your cost per lead. That's the first factor. Second factor is because quizzes are incredibly shareable, people will share them with their friends, you get a ton of cheap traffic. This is viral traffic at play because people will share them with their friends and say, hey, this is my result. What was your result? Um, those leads, that traffic is effectively free, which drives down your effective paid cost per lead. So incredibly cheap leads. That's reason number one. Reason number two is that, and the question people always ask is, okay, great, this is cheap traffic, but does it actually convert? And we measure this. We're typically able to double to anywhere uh, to triple our sales conversion rate on the back of the quiz. In this particular quiz, we convert at 3.2x uh, on a, from a sales perspective, what we otherwise sell if we're not driving people through a quiz. Now you might wonder what's the reason behind that? Well, the reason for that is because remember when you're driving people through a quiz, instead of selling people in a one size fits all way, instead of showing everybody the same generic video, you're able to customize the content someone gets based on the responses to their quiz. So you can show them a custom uh, case study, a custom testimonial. You can make a sales argument that speaks specifically to their situation. You can highlight the unique features and benefits of your product or service that is most relevant to that specific individual. So the net effect is that you can double to anywhere to triple your sales conversion rate on the back end. The third factor at play, in addition to cheap leads, higher conversion rate, is you can blow up the volume in your business. Um, and it's not uncommon to go to 10x the lead volume in your business. So to put things in perspective, in 55 days, this little quiz that we put together uh, generated 21,564 uh, front-end leads, uh, led to um, uh, $8.5 million in revenue. Um, and the reason for that is because a quiz, when done right, can go viral. And in fact, next month when we do our deep dive, I'm going to show you some examples of quizzes in all sorts of different markets that have gone viral because of the way in which they've shared. Um, there's one in the parenting market, for example, that was a concept around what type of parent are you? What's your parenting style that went viral and generated over a million email subscribers in 10 days? And this is the in the Hispanic, uh, Spanish speaking market, um, a million email subscribers in 10 days because the quiz went completely viral. So, um, so what makes a quiz? So as you're thinking about, okay, hopefully you're a little bit excited now about the idea of a quiz in your business. Let's talk a little bit about um, the flow that every well-designed quiz follows. There are three steps. And then we're gonna talk about the three types of quizzes to choose from. Then I'm gonna wrap for today and uh, set us up for our deep dive next month. So um, when it comes to a quiz, every quiz follows three simple steps. And it looks like this. Hey, I hope you're enjoying this video and I wanna let you know that I have a new book that's come out and if you'd like to get it absolutely free, there's a link below in the description or you can wait till the end of this video or you can simply go to joesfreebook.com and you can get a copy there. The three steps graphically can be represented as three phases to the process. One, two, three, and it looks like this. So, Phase one here is attract. Every good quiz has an incredibly compelling hook that attracts the right type of prospect into your world. What funnel is right for you? What's your number one golf swing killer? What's your weight loss type? What's your retirement readiness score? There's an incredibly compelling hook that attracts the right type of people in your world. The next step is to, in these um, little uh, dots that you see um, here, um, these represent the questions that you ask that are designed to diagnose a person's situation. Just like a doctor, you're asking questions to diagnose a person's situation. So you can ultimately, step three in our scenario, let's use this color here, is to prescribe. Like a doctor, you're diagnosing and prescribing the right solution for them. This could mean a different product or service based on a person's circumstances. It could be talking about your one product or service in a slightly different way based on that person's situation. So in our training that we do next month, we're gonna dissect this further. We're gonna talk about these three steps and how to implement these three steps in your quiz funnel. And last but not least, and this is gonna be your homework assignment to think about between now and our time together next month, 
is which of the three types of quizzes makes the most sense for you in your business? There are three types of quizzes that work incredibly well. And they are as follows. Type number one is what we call a type quiz. A type quiz is um, exactly what Aaron and Jocelyn brought up in their talk. What's your relationship personality type? So which of the following subcategories are you? What type of funnel is right for you? What type of annuity product is right for you? What type of trust is right for you to set up? So that's the first type of quiz. It's what we call a type uh, quiz. It's in contrast to the second um, quiz framework, which is what we call a killer quiz. A killer quiz, in contrast, is one where you're not putting people into one of several types. You're identifying the single biggest mistake people are making in the area of their life that you help them with, the transformation that you provide to people. So in other words, what's your number one golf swing killer? What is your biggest retirement mistake that you're making right now? And what it does is it helps people identify what they're doing wrong and then leads you to be able to explain what they should do instead to get the desired outcome that you deliver with your product or service. And last but not least, we have the third quiz framework, which is what we call a score quiz. A score quiz is where you're helping people evaluate where they are relative to where they should be in a specific area of their life. So for example, what's your retirement readiness score? What's your authority score in your life or in your business compared to your peers? It's a way for people to measure how they stack up against their competition, their peers, or where they should be relative to the place and time in their life that they're in right now. Okay, I hope you found that video awesome and useful. So if you wanna get a free copy of my book, I want you to click here. And if you wanna watch some more videos that'll be useful and awesome, click here. Go ahead, they're over here. Do it now. Come on. Thank you, watch them.